Hello everyone and welcome back to another Sunday School Review where we're going to get into God's Word and see what we can, can glean to apply to our everyday life. Uh, and Paul is, um, he didn't come up short at all today because we, we see a case that Paul has to kind of defend himself and also really defend the new covenant uh, because there were those that were still trying to hold on to the law. A lesson today is bold ministers, bold ministers. You got to be bold to preach God's word and to teach God's word uh, nowadays more than ever before because so many folks are caving into society and the demands of society. And uh, the church uh, is, uh, is in that list of those that are caving as well. Second Corinthians chapter three, verses five to 18 is why lesson is coming from. And uh, I'm going to go right past those questions. But the first thing is Paul's expertise. It's broken down in really three sections. That's number one. Number two, uh, well, in, in that expertise, first is the source. Verse number five, which is God. Second is the focus, which is the new covenant. Verse number six. Then in the, sec the second part of our lesson is Paul's interpretation verses 7 through 11. First, the, we see the first if-then argument. If-then in verse 7 and 8. The second if-then argument is in 9 through 10, 9 and 10. And the third if-then argument is verse 11. The third part of our lesson is Paul's application, uh, verses 12 through 18. And the first part of this is with face covering, verse 12 to 15. The second part is without face covering. Now let's read the entire lesson, scripture lesson text, and we'll come back and uh, once we've read the whole lesson text and, and do some uh, commentary. As indicated in your Sunday School book, we're coming from the same international Sunday School commentary. That's a very, very good, very good uh, educational book and in the whole year. Uh, there's a lot of learning that we gain from that book. So the, first, the, the very five says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also had made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kill it, but the spirit give it life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more do the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excel it. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, uh, which veil is done away in Christ. But even until this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image 
from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, in your Sunday school book, you see a picture, this picture here. The Lord's glory is eternal. Uh, it's never ending. It's a, it doesn't, that's not a, a stopping point. It's eternal. And what I'm going to do now is kind of uh, give a little commentary, uh, a little context, before getting into the actual lesson commentary of our lesson today. In AD 57, the year that Paul wrote uh, the letter that we call 2 Corinthians, he had developed a what's called a multi-year relationship with the church uh, that he had planted in Corinth. He had established that congregation on his second missionary journey of AD 52 through 54, as recorded in Acts chapter 18. And Bible experts recognized this letter as the most difficult to understand among all of Paul's 13 epistles. This letter and others to the church in Corinth um, revealed that Paul had stayed in touch with the church. He didn't just plant it and, and kept it moving. He stayed in touch with them in contact. And this was the nature of, of what Paul did, his church planning ministry. He had a system of follow-up. And we can learn a whole lot about that today. The letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians show a congregation that was in deep trouble. Challenges to Paul's apostolic authority aggravated these troubles. And his letters to, to that church feature responses to these personal criticisms. When they talk about Paul and they question his Apostolic, apostolic calling. So therefore, Paul used a whole lot of ink in 2 Corinthians to defend the legitimacy of his apostolic calling. And as a matter of fact, more than 500 words in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through the third chapter, verse 18, kind of set the stage uh, for a longer defense or defenses of his ap apostolic ministry uh, later in the epistle. And today's lesson is going to cover uh, a great majority, about 24 verses uh, of this dialogue uh, that Paul had with the churches. So in, in the first part of our lesson, we see Paul's expertise. We're going to talk about the source. And God, we all know, is the source of our total supply. So in verse Paul, Paul uses a word that, that is translated Sufficient or and sufficiency several times in, in this letter. But Paul makes it very clear that even though uh, he had confidence, which is important, in the results of his ministry, God always gets the glory. Not him and not his co-laborers. Matter of fact, let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and we'll read verse number 3 of the same letter. And I wrote this same unto you, at least when I came, I should have sorrow from them, from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, Paul says this, but the grace of God, but, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Uh, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So Paul made it real clear that everything, although he was happy for the results, it was all God, and God gets all the glory. And in verse 6, we see the focus on the new covenant in Paul's expertise. The word ministers uh, describe the leadership function of one who we now know of as a pastor. The primary job of the pastor was preaching the word of God. That was a primary job. And while a lot, all the other leaders cared for uh, the, the activities of the church, the caring of the church, you read about this in James chapter 5 and verse 14. The term that we see New Testament refers to the new covenant. As a matter of fact, let me read Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 6. 
Uh, I got to speed up here. But as, but as it is, Christ has acquired a priestly ministry, which is more excellent than the old Levitical priestly ministry, for he is the mediator, orbiter of a better covenant, uniting God and man, which has been enacted and rest on better promises. A primary focus of the Old Testament class, uh, the old, the old uh, was his old covenant, was that it brought death by condemning people as lawbreakers. I want you to read Romans chapter 2, verse 27, verse, and chapter 7, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. But the benefit of, of following the letter of the law, that was a benefit, it was learning God's ways, not earning salvation from the Lord. However, the new covenant, the new covenant, give it life. So life under the new covenant is connected with something. What is it connected to? The Holy Ghost, the Spirit, a concept that was introduced by Jesus, but also stressed by Paul. I want you to read John chapter 6, verse 6 to 3, what John said and what Paul said in Romans chapter 7 <clears throat> and verse number 6. Then we see the first, in Paul's interpretation, the second part of our lesson, the first if-then argument in verse 7 and 8. The form of this argument is this. If such and such, and, if such, and such is true, then so-and-so must also be true as well. So Paul knows that, Paul knows, uh, and, and, and internally, intellectually, spiritually, he knows that the new covenant, which is the ministration of the Spirit, is much more superior than the old covenant, which is the ministration of death. But, but that does not mean that the old covenant was defective or had failed in some way. I want you to read Romans 9 and 6 and, and kind of with a little context on that. The old covenant, when I said it didn't, it didn't fail, the old covenant was perfect in establishing God's expectation, which left Israel inexcusable regarding what? The knowledge of sin. So the, the, the law identified, couldn't justify, but it did identify what sin was. I want you to read Romans 7 and 7, Galatians 3 and 24. It's reasonable then that uh, in creating human beings, which is what God did, in his own image, God expected us to be holy. Why? Because he is holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. And that expectation resulted in God giving his requirements for holiness. I want you to read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, and chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. Then we get into, we're still in, the, in this, this first if-then argument in verse number 8. So, so but, but how, the question is this, how do you define a holy life? How do, you def how do we define a code of behavior? Behavior. The Old Testament law was so important that it was engraven in stone. Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 through 5. So, so when we say things like today, it's not written in stone. What we're really saying, this is just the first draft. This is a preliminary. It's not written in stone. It's not, I, don't, I, I haven't inked it in pencil it in because it is subject to change. It's temporary. It's, it could change. It's a preliminary. It's not the final draft. It's not the stamped version of the, uh, the blueprint. It's a preliminary. So keeping the law then perfectly led to a perfectly holy life, but they couldn't keep it perfectly. But a person, a person is not made, anybody is not, nobody's made perfect or holy by corruptible things. We're made holy by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What can make me whole again? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So Exodus chapter 34 verses 29 through 35 is the basis for Paul's argument, for Paul's illustration regarding 
the face of Moses, as indicated in this verse here, the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. The main point of this comparison, this contrast, is the radiance of Moses' face. The way made Moses' face was shining and, and radiant. That radiance, uh, like the covenant that he had re that Moses received, was temporary. And that radiance faded away with time. And Moses had a veil over his head uh, so as to the people wouldn't see the fading of that radiance. But the new covenant, the new covenant will not fade away. I want you to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now we'll see the second if-then argument. If, if so-and-so is true, then, then so-and-so then this, this so -so must also be true. And so in verse 89, we see the introduction of a parallel, what the commentary calls a parallel description. The administration of death in, ver in verses 7 of chapter 3 is the same as the ministration of condemn, condemnation in describing the old covenant. I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse number 26. And so the ministration of the spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 8 that we just read is the same as the ministration of righteousness in breaking down or describing the new covenant in Jesus, in Christ the anointed one and his anointing. So then the new covenant is far more superior because those who uh, deserve condemnation for sin receives, what they receive? Imputed. Imputed righteousness because of what Jesus did. Now I'm going to read something here in, in Romans chapter 3 verses, uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version, Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now righteousness of God has been clearly revealed independently and completely apart from the law, though it is actually confirmed by the law and the words and writings of the prophets. This righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those Jews, for, for all those Jews or Gentiles who believe and trust in him and, uh, and acknowledge him as God's son, there's no distinction. Then Paul said in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made Christ, who knew no sin, ju judicially, to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God, that is, we would be, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness. That's a big, big deal. And so now we see the third if in argument in verse 11. If then argument. The Old Testament is what the word says in verse 11, that which is done away. That's the Old Covenant. When I say the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And the New Covenant is that which remaineth. The New Covenant, the death, burial, and resurrection the blood that Jesus shed for all of us to, to be reconnected, atonement. The law could not, could not, could not make humanity perfect. Why couldn't it do it? Why couldn't the law do that? Because of the weakness of fallen man. I want you to read Romans chapter 8 and verse number 3. So the law was meant to reveal the best. What's the best? What is the best? Salvation by faith in Jesus. The law, the law pointed us toward the best. In him, in him, sin was condemned in the flesh, and the righteous requirement of the law was accomplished as a result. I want to read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number one. For since the law was, since, so since the law has only a shadow, just a pale representation of the good things to come, not the very image of those things, it can never, by offering the same sacrifice, uh, sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach its altar. It just didn't have the power to do it. It took a greater power. 
that was so much so much far so much more superior to than it was to get that done. Then we see with face covering in, in the third part of our lesson, Paul's application with face covering, verse 12 to 13. The word hope is used more than 60 times in Paul, you know, Paul, wrote, Paul wrote half of the, New, of the New Testament, over half, 13 epistles. He used the word hope more than 60 times. And Paul's hope showed up in his boldness expressed as great plainness of speech in verse number 11. So then if Paul, if Paul, if Paul had a voice that was lukewarm, a lukewarm with lukewarm, Trembling, trembling in his voice, lukewarm, lukewarm overtones. Like I think this is the case. Maybe this is the case. There's a possibility. Perhaps this is the case. Perhaps there is a new co covenant. His message, his word, his demonstration would have been very weak and ineffective. But that wasn't the case with Paul. Paul was bold in proclaiming and defending himself and also the new covenant versus the old covenant. So then the veil was some kind of face cover covering that part that, uh, that, that Moses had over his head. I don't, we don't know what it was made of, but it was a covering that did not allow them to see the glory that was on him at that time. That, and also they didn't see when it faded away. In verse 16, Paul says the same thing. We're talking about without face covering. The same thing in Romans chapter 11, verses 23. You can go back and read that. But Paul was using agricultural comparisons. As a matter of fact, let's read it. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 23, with this agricultural comparison. Paul says, they also, if they abide not in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And, and, and the way this happens, how does this happen, Paul? It happens when, when hearts are turned to the Lord, as indicated in verse 16, turn to the Lord. And so it's not enough though now just to turn away from sin. Okay, I'm going to turn away from sin. No, it's more than that. It's to be fully committed. To be fully committed is to turn to the Lord, turn away from sin and turn to the Lord. Not turn to personal development, that's important. Not turn to just, okay, I'm just going to do the right thing. No, no, it's to turn to the Lord and to trust and to depend on him, to turn to the Lord in repentance. Yes, I'm going to turn, but what am I going to turn to? I'm going to turn to the Lord in repentance. I want you to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9. Then in verse 17, without face covering, we still see without face covering. The phrase, the Lord is that spirit. It indicates something. It indicates real liberty. And real liberty, real freedom is brought about by Jesus. On the other hand, the Israelites had a human leader as a mediator, mediating to God on their behalf. But Paul's audience had access to God, not through a mediator, not through a man. They had access to God by the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God dwelling on the inside that brought about a change and brings about a change more and more over time in all of us. Man, that's a big deal. So, so they didn't have to have anyone to go behind the veil, go, but go behind the Holy of Holies a certain time during the year to, to really ask for forgiveness for his sins and the sins of the people. No more killing of all this killing of animals is necessary anymore. And I think we've gotten so used to that that we, we've lost the, the knowledge of the power of that. That's a really, really big deal, class. So the Holy Ghost is on the inside. And so through the covenant then of the Spirit, they were liberated. They were set free from the veil that Moses had over his head. And, 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 and now the glory never fades away. 
I got to read something here as I get ready to bring this lesson to a close. John 8, 32 says this, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And then Romans 8 and 2 says this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 says this, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Then Galatians 5 and 1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Look what Paul said in Galatians 5, 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, 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 church, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God makes all the difference. And that's how we're made free. That's where the liberty comes from. And that, that, that glory never wears off, never fades away, as did the old covenant. We'll close with verse number 18 here. And I'm going to read verse 18 again without this face covering. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. From glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. So Paul now moves to contrast those who choose to remain veiled, to keep the veil over their head, with those who wisely, with wisdom, choose not to have the veil. What it says in verse 18, we all with open face, no veil. The glory of the old covenant was only given to Moses. Uh, the benefits of the new covenant is available to everybody, everyone in Christ. So then in this sense, we can at least get a glimpse of the glory of the Lord uh, because the, the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit dwells on the inside. Look at what it says in, in John, 1 John 3 and 2. You've read it. You've heard it many times. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that uh, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In this life that we're living in now, we go from glory to glory in Christ, which is why it's important that we remain in Christ, remain in his word, remain in his sanctuary, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Be around people that have like minds. that are striving for the same goal. Heaven is our goal. Heaven is our aim. This old world is not our home. We're just pilgrims passing through. There's a better place. There's a better land. There's a place where there's no more sickness, no more sorrow. There's a place where this corruptible body here has to put on incorruption to get incorruption to get there. This old mortal body here has to put on immortality to go in. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So this body here is going to go through a total metamorphosis. We only now have a foretaste. We only have a down payment uh, of what's going to happen when we, when we inherit where we're going someday. You want to be ready. We all want to be ready because that day is coming. You look around, see the hand right on the wall, see the world now and the condition the world is in and how there's no real respect uh, for, for God or man. People are doing what they want to do, whatever is right in their own eyes. So church, get ready and, and preachers, you got to be bold now. These are bold ministers that's telling it like it is. Love everybody, but, but tell the truth, speak the truth in love. And we out of time. Hey, look, y'all have a great rest of the, the week. Look forward to seeing you again for our next Sunday School Review. Y'all take care.